Good morning. It's really exciting to be here to talk about the problems we can solve at what is really historic time in computing. In particular, I'm going to describe why practical quantum computing could be just a few years away and how quantum software will be instrumental in getting us there. Much of what I will talk about today is work done by the EPIC project, an NSF expedition in computing. Expeditions are the National Science Foundation's flagship investments in computer science. Our expedition is led by the University of Chicago and includes some great collaborators at MIT, Princeton, Duke, and Santa Barbara. I'll note also that some of the work I'll talk about today was done with our dear friend and founding team member, Margaret Martinosi, who is speaking next and last year went to lead the computer science director at NSF. So let's start with developments in quantum hardware. For the first time, we have, a quantum, we have quantum machines that are approaching a useful size. In fact, if these machines were not noisy and prone to errors, they would already be more powerful than the world's largest supercomputers for certain problems. Unfortunately, as mentioned in the last talk, they're quite noisy and error prone, which is why we call them noisy intermediate scale quantum machines or NISC machines. Yet as John Preskill, who coined the term says, we're in a historic time of science and technology. In fact, we're at the cusp of a revolution in computing power. You can see on the left here that the size of quantum machines has been growing exponentially over time. It is also the case that every quantum bit you add to a machine doubles the machine's computing power. Thus, the power of quantum machines is growing at a double exponential. That's like owning a stock that doubles in price every year, but also your number of shares doubles every year. This rapid progress led Google to demonstrate something called quantum supremacy last year, mentioned earlier. In this experiment, their quantum machine ran a specially designed quantum program in seconds that would take the world's largest supercomputers days to run. But the Google experiment was not for a useful quantum program, and we still face a significant gap between the quantum machines we have and the practical algorithms we want to run. In this graph, we have the number of qubits on the x-axis and the error rate of quantum operations on the y-axis, both in a log scale. You can see that machines have been proved exponentially over time, moving from the lower left to the upper right. But we still see a significant gap between the algorithmic requirements in the upper right and the machines. Our EPIC project was formed to address this gap. Specifically, our EPIC goal is to improve the efficiency of algorithms by 100 to 1,000 times by co-designing them with software and hardware. This is roughly equivalent to 10 to 20 years of technology progress without co-design improvements. To clarify, we mean efficiency in terms of the number of qubits, the number of quantum operations, and the level of reliability in the algorithm needs on a machine. We will accomplish this through a series of full-stack, physics-aware software optimizations each on the order of 10 times an efficiency improvement. In other words, quantum software will bring us 10 to 20 years closer to quantum advantage. Now note this idea of software advances to get the most out of our hardware has been quite successful in classical computing. For example, large data center operators such as Google, Microsoft, IBM, and Amazon have to keep up with the world's exponentially growing data needs as shown in this graph. What they do is work very hard to increase software efficiency in order to meet growing demand and delay having to buy new hardware. For example, if they can increase the software efficiency by a factor of two, they can delay buying new hardware for three years. Now in two and a half years since Epic began, we have had some great progress towards our quantum goals. We have developed many software optimizations and architectural designs that improve algorithm efficiency on physical machines by factors of 10 to 10,000 thus in some cases already surpassing our goals. We're working to better integrate these optimizations and develop more in the remainder of our project. Overall, we have published 60 papers, four of which have won best paper awards. We have six patents pending and have spun out a quantum software startup, Supertech, which has completed Series C funding. You'll hear more from Supertech today at one of the panels. We have published a new textbook to help establish a new discipline of quantum computer system design and have edX courses planned this year based upon this material. Finally, many of our techniques that you will see today have already been adopted and implemented in commercial software, including IBM's Qiskit and Google's CERC. 
Now here's a sample of some of these improvements over the last two and a half years. We have algorithms work, including work to reduce measurements in quantum chemistry algorithms by up to 30 times, which was awarded the IBM Q best paper last year. We have physics aware compiler work, including noise aware mapping and scheduling and work with three level logic using Qtrits. Both of these papers won the micro top pick award, which is for the best of the best work in all of computer architecture in a given year. We also have substantial education and outreach efforts, including tutorials that have trained hundreds of researchers, a Quora session that was viewed by over 150,000 viewers, K-12 efforts that have led our education lead PI, Diana Franklin, to co-lead the writing of the national QIS key concepts to guide K-12 education, and to co-lead the Q-12 partnership recently announced by the White House. Now, to give you a better sense of how software can close the gap between algorithms and hardware, I will briefly talk about six examples of our work. For our first example, we will look at optimizing quantum programs to adapt to the daily variations in noise on real hardware. Our approach is motivated by IBM calibration data for their IBM Q machines on the right here. On the top right, you can see that qubit quality varies considerably from day to day. You can see the different lines each represent a qubit, and on each day, uh, the reliability, which is shown in the y-axis, uh, changes considerably, and even the worst qubit is different for different days. On the bottom right, you can see that the operation error rate between different pairs of qubits also varies considerably for different pairs and for different days. Now, classical compilers compile once for a family of machines. You can run your executable on any number of physical machines. What we're going to do here is not only compile for a program for a specific machine, but for a specific day for that machine. Now, our strategy is actually fairly simple. We take a circuit such as the one on the left, and we map the logical qubits to the physical qubits of the machine. That means the P0 through P3 that's on the, the left in the circuit ends up on each one of the dots on the right. Now in the upper right, you'll see that the IBM native Qiskit compiler places the qubits just near each other and to minimize communication as shown in the top right figure. So you can see the P0, P1, P2, P3 are all near each other sort of on the left on the top right. Now instead in the bottom right, what we do is we try to avoid the bad qubits and the bad links for a given day denoted by the gray circles and the red X's. You can see the logical qubits P0 through P3 are all clustered in the middle on the bottom right, avoiding the gray circles and red X's. Now the challenge is to encode our goals in an optimizer that efficiently finds the solution that balances liability and communication. So our results are that we can get an average of almost three times better reliability with a maximum of 28 times improvement. This work has already been integrated into new versions of IBM software and has really changed how quantum programs are compiled to hardware. Overall, the key was to break the compile once model and integrate daily calibration data to achieve substantially better program reliability. Now the second technique I wanna talk about breaks the typical quantum software abstraction of machine instructions. In this work, we'll target our compiler more directly towards control pulses for quantum devices. Now on the left, we see a small piece of a quantum program. The typical flow is to translate or compile to quantum assembly instructions in the top path, and then translate each one of those into microwave control signals shown on the right, on the top right. Now our approach takes the program and direct translation resulting in faster and simpler pulses on the bottom right. Our overall result is two to 10 times faster control. You can see why by, by looking at the sphere to the right, which shows where our computation starts and where it wants to end. Creating control pulses instruction by instruction results in the indirect gray path. Our approach takes the direct path represented by the red arrow. However, there's a problem and that is that it takes hours of classical compute time to do this translation. This would not be a problem if you had to compile once before execution, but it's a problem for programs that repeat many times. 
Now, as mentioned earlier in talks today, one of our leading approaches to computation in this era, machines, is hybrid classical quantum algorithms, in which a classical optimizer repeatedly invokes a quantum machine with a quantum program with different input parameters. Each of these invocations would require recompiling our quantum program. Obviously, we cannot afford to spend hours on each compilation before each of thousands of iterations. This is of particular interest in our discussion today since the hybrid classical quantum approach includes many algorithms that could be useful in the finance domain. Our solution is a classical software technique called partial compilation, in which we use information from previous compilations to speed up recompilation with slightly different inputs. In the case of variational quantum eigensolvers, we can find program blocks in which only single input changes which are then very amenable to partial compilation. Now, the uh, variational quantum eigensolver is a quantum chemistry um, algorithm, which was mentioned in la the last talk. Now, the end result is that we can still achieve pulse sequences that are an average of two times faster, but speed up classical compile time by 10 to 80 times. There are two pending patents relating to our pulse work, and this technology is part of the focus of our startup, Supertech. Now, once again, the key insight here was to break the traditional abstraction of machine instructions and focus on generating pulses. Now, our third example pertains to quantum chemistry algorithms. It looks at like how we can restructure the actual quantum program in one of these hybrid algorithms, um, specifically the variational quantum eigensolver. Um, and this algorithm repeats itself thousands, if not millions of times. Each time we have to take a lot of measurements in the quantum machine, which takes a lot of time over so many repetitions. We restructure the algorithm to take 30 times fewer measurements, getting more out of each measurement. This work recently won the best paper award at the IEEE Quantum Computing and Engineering Conference. And in the first for us, the preprint of this paper won an award, the IBM Quantum Global Best Paper a year earlier. Now what we do is to represent the measurements needed in this graph on the left and find groups of measurements that are not independent using an algorithm called clique cover. We can measure these groups simultaneously and separate them later with classical computing. Now using this approach, we ran an experiment which calculates the ground state energy of a deuteron atom using an IBM quantum computer. In the graph on the right, we can compare our scheme, the blue squares, versus the old way, the green triangles, versus the ideal result, the dotted line. Our scheme is more accurate by 7% on even this small problem, and this improvement will be much larger on larger problems and machines in the future. Now, I like this work because it shows how algorithms can be restructured to be more efficient. I'm hopeful that optimization algorithms finance may be amenable to restructuring also. Now, our fourth example focuses on reusing quantum bits. This is similar to memory management in classical computers, but quantum bits can be reused if we pay the cost of uncomputation to unentangle them from our ongoing computation. So we have to undo part of our work in order to reuse our qubits. Note that this is similar to the MCMR technique mentioned in the last talk, but it applies to more quantum algorithms, since MCMR assumes that the qubit reused is not entangled with the results, which it often is. Surprisingly, the extra work to undo computation is worthwhile, even on near-term machines. In this picture of an IBM machine on the right, let's say we need to, a new qubit at position 24. Now we can either undo some computation and free number 24 up, or we can move an unused qubit from say position 50. All the red arrows are swap operations to perform the necessary movement and can end up causing more error than the undo operations. Overall, we end up seeing about 50% improvement in accuracy when we strategically reuse qubits instead of moving them. The reason this work was surprising is that we designed this method for larger, more reliable machines of the future, where we expect 10 times better accuracy. We're somewhat astonished to that learn that it works for near-term machines. Now, in our fifth example, We'll break the abstraction of the qubit itself 
and look at storing three values instead of two as described earlier today in each quantum device. This is called a qtrid instead of a qubit. Now the idea of three level logic has been around for some time in classical computing, but it makes more sense in quantum systems because there are many more than uh, two energy levels in a quantum system and we're just ignoring the higher energy states when we encode qubits. A three level system or qtrit can be encoded using three energy states. This will be especially useful for programs that need some extra temporary space. The result is that we can use substantially fewer quantum devices to run our programs, up to 70 times fewer. Now this work has generated a lot of interest among experimentalists. And we're working with IBM, Rigetti, Lawrence Berkeley, and Lawrence Livermore to optimize and study QTRIT circuits on several physical platforms. In fact, the figure on the right shows a recent experiment we did with IBM that shows their machine switching between three states on one of their devices. Now our sixth and final example shows how software can complement hardware by achieving the same functionality on simpler hardware. We address the problem of crosstalk, which occurs when two operations shown by the black rectangles in the figure occur too close to each other on a physical machine. This can increase error by a factor of 10. We can avoid crosstalk by making operations take turns in time or by building hardware that can operate at different frequencies when two operations are too close to each other. Here are these options in a picture. We have qubits that can change frequency and ones that cannot. We have connections between qubits called couplers that can change frequencies and ones that cannot. In general, it is harder to build a tunable piece of hardware that can change frequencies. Our target system is on the left tunable qubits and fixed couplers. Now we find that our target system is 13 times more reliable than an IBM-like system of fixed qubits and fixed couplers, but it's arguably harder to build because you have to have a tunable qubit. But we also find that our system is roughly equivalent in reliability to a Google-like system of tunable qubits and tunable couplers, which is arguably easier to build um, which, well, the Google system is harder to build than our system because it has a tunable coupler instead of a fixed coupler. Now, this is how our system works. We use an algorithm called graph coloring and a solver to assign qubit frequencies. Then we also use a specially constructed graph to represent crosstalk and coloring and a solver to assign interaction frequencies. Now, you can see in the graph colorings that the same color can never be next to itself. This is how we make sure neighboring operations have different frequencies and thus avoid crosstalk. Here are some results across several quantum programs where the bars measure reliability and higher is better. You can see that our approach, the red bars, is significantly more reliable than the blue IBM-like system and comparable to the green Google-like system. So let me recap how we had to restructure the software to achieve our crosstalk gains and the gains from the other examples today. We had to go much more directly and more deeply into the hardware level from the program level. Not only that, there are implications for what hardware design you would choose to get the most efficiency out of your combined software and hardware system. Now this approach of vertically integrated physics-aware software stacks is analogous to a growing trend in classical computing called domain-specific system design. This was highlighted as the next architectural revolution by recent Turing Award winners John Hennessy and David Patterson. A good example of classical domain-specific systems is the one for machine learning based on TensorFlow. You can see in the picture that there are multiple paths and shortcuts to multiple tar machine targets in this kind of system. Now, before I end, I want to mention that EPIC has been incredibly fortunate to be part of a world-leading quantum ecosystem in Chicago. The University of Chicago has 32 faculty working in the quantum space, six in computer science, including two new junior faculty in theory and quantum programming languages. And the remaining 26 faculty are in the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering and the Physics and Chemistry Departments. 
At an even larger scale, the Chicago Quantum Exchange brings together the University of Chicago, Argonne, Fermilab, Northwestern, UIUC, and the University of Chicago, Wisconsin in a tremendous consortium. Chicago's strength in quantum has recently resulted in several awarded national centers, which Governor Pritzker mentioned earlier today. A new NSF Quantum Leap Challenge Institute led by UIUC on focusing on quantum networking and distributed quantum systems. Uh, Brian DeMarco will talk about that very uh, in two talks, I think. And two out of the five National Quantum Initiative Centers, um, QNEX focused on quantum communication and sensing led by Argonne, specifically by David Oshalom, who will also speak later today, and a center focused on superconducting materials led by Fermilab. Now, EPIC researchers are part of all these efforts, as well as several other NSF and DOE projects. It's really just a really exciting time to be part of quantum in Chicago. Now, let me end with a call for industrial partners. Quantum software and hardware will soon come together to solve practical problems. Now is the right time to do a deep dive into some driving applications to demonstrate value in quantum computation. Both Epic and our spin out SuperTech are very interested in optimization problems, particularly in finance. So thank you, and you can find out more about Epic activities and the, uh, at the Epic website listed here.